finish. Finish. What's your age? I'm eight years old. Eight years old. And what uh, does it mean for you uh, being a punk? What? What does it mean to be a punk? Uh, I don't know. No? I just like it. I like the music. I like, I like the rhythm. Do you like that? Uh-huh. you like being a punk, eh? Do you like being a punk? Yeah, it's, it's fun to be, even though everybody makes fun of me at school. Real blood coming from my nose right here, right here. This is genuine blood. But anyway, I appreciate it. Eigenlijk dacht ik dat het verschijnsel punk alweer bijna uitgestorven was... tot ik in de zomer van 1981 in Los Angeles was. En daar overal punks tegenkwam, alsof hier sprake was van een massale jeugdbeweging. En omdat zoveel verschijnselen zich vanuit Los Angeles over de hele wereld verspreiden... was ik er als kippen bij om u te berichten over wat ook u, ouders in Nederland... wat dit betreft nog te wachten zou kunnen staan. Take off your swastika. It's making me angry. Take off your swastika. It really nauseates me. You say, Frank, it's just a symbol. It's just an emblem. Come on, don't get so upset. It's just a righteous decoration. Well, it means a little more to me. Cause I'm a Jewish lesbian, you see, and fascism isn't anarchy. Fascism isn't anarchy. Fascism is not anarchy. If it was you in those ovens, you wouldn't think it was so cool. If it was you in those ovens, you wouldn't think it was so cool. If it was you in those ovens, you wouldn't think it was so god damn cool. Any excuse that anyone gives you for wearing them, that it looks great, that it, that it just looks nice and all that, that's a pile of crap to me. I yeah. mean, they're symbols, and it, young people today have a lot of energy, and they've got brains, too. And uh, they should look at symbols before they attach them to their bodies. And uh, I don't buy any of the crap about swastikas being shock value. Mm -hmm. um, if they're wearing them just to make people mad, that's stupid. Half the people that are wearing them that I have talked to don't even know what fascism is. Um, they just wear it because they look cool. I do that song, Take Off Your Swastikas, and there'll be like, sometimes there's like 10 young people in the front with swastikas on giving me the Sieg Heil. Um, and then they all sneak up backstage when their friends aren't looking and say, I really like that song, but don't tell my friends. Kill.
James and uh, Sheen, uh, Johnny Rotten, uh, the inventor more or less of punk, uh, said once that he didn't take punk very seriously. Uh, it, for him it was a, a joke and nothing else. I think it's a joke. <laughs> I do, seriously. <laughs> yeah, I can see that, but it's just... It's a, to him, it was all a money-making thing, you know, because he knew that that the kids that kids wanted to do something besides what their parents did, which was have long hair and smoke pot all day and and anti, you know, go and march against Vietnam and stuff. So he, I don't know, he's like the father of it, and yeah, it is a joke. I don't know. Yeah. So you see, you seem to take it quite seriously, yeah? Yeah, well, it's like a lot, it's like my, it's like what I do, you know? And so, it's like you, you wear the stuff or whatever, and all my friends are into it and everything. Yeah, I guess I do take it kind of seriously. It's a lifestyle. What's this lifestyle uh, about? About being a joke. I guess. Yeah. About being a joke. You're a joke. He is. I think <laughs> I think it's a joke because In a sense it's a joke, but it's not like a funny joke, you know. It's like a joke like ridiculous, like Sarc lame, you know. Sar yeah, like sarcastically, yeah, it's a joke, but but as in the funny, you know, it's not, I don't laugh about it. You know what I'm saying? Can you tell me uh, how you became a punk? You say it's so cute. <laughs> well, um, I don't know. I've always, like, been, like, really different and everything. But I kind of kept it together. I mean, I had a really, you know, I, I had a good job and... I had a really nice apartment. I had a nicer apartment compared to even anybody I worked with, you know. And I was making good money and I had a car and, you know, technically my life was together, except that I wasn't really happy. I was younger than everybody I worked with. And um, I had to grow up real fast because I left home when I was like 16. And I started meeting more and more people, like when the mask and all those places first started and everybody was living at the Canterbury, I knew people there. But it wasn't something that I felt that I could like throw everything away for, you know? I mean, I could dress like that, I could cut off all my hair, but I wasn't like, it wasn't my life, right? And then I started really hating what I was doing and really liking the people I met. And I just really identified with them. I mean, it wasn't so much where there was a lot of stealing going on and it wasn't so much I felt that they were better or worse than I was, or, you know, was I, drugs were more available or, anything like that I mean I would still stay the same person I still like to cook and everything and have everybody over but my life began to really change and this this one girl I know described it this way she said the first time she ever came to one of my parties I came down the stairs and I was dressed in like a perfect little costume and I was just so cute and my hair was just so cute and I was young but I had it like really together more together than anybody else she knew and um, she goes and your apartment was just so beautiful and she said boy I really want to be friends with this girl and the next party she came to she said there you were she goes you're the same person she goes but you were dressed sort of sloppy and there was graffiti all over your walls and then she said after that it got steadily worse and I didn't consider it getting steadily worse I eventually lost my job because I got really self-destructive I hated what I was doing I hated my life I had the things that people wanted but I wasn't happy and I was too young to be doing them and um I wasn't me. I mean, I had to change. I had to be a different person every day. So um, I lost my job. I was going out like six nights a week and just hanging out, you know, just doing nothing more than arguing with people and getting drunk and going to shows. And it seemed like really, that seemed to me so much better because at least people talked to me for real and knew me the way I really was. And, and I mean, I like sitting around with a bunch of people. I really honestly do like that. And I like doing drugs and I like getting drunk and I like, you know, thrift shopping. And I like making fun of trendy people. You know, I mean <laughs>
Raisfeld, um, can you tell me something about uh, the background of, uh, of the punk kids? Uh? Um, I'm kind of more of a like fifth generation punk, which is going on now. And I was one of the early timers since I've only lived in LA about a year now. Most of the kids here are just like into the punk scene for, they're just bored, you know, they have nothing really else to do. Most of them come from, you know, middle class, upper middle class families. You meet very few, you know, punk kids that their parents are poor. It's mostly out of boredom. Mm -hmm. they're, they're all coming from uh, r rather wealthy families. Yeah. And like you. Yep. <laughs> People with uh, uh, a comfortable house and a swimming pool in their backyard, uh, as it is here. Yep, that's correct. You think it's boring? It's very boring. Having everything, you know, there for you. Having your parents pay for your education and having the house and the microwave oven and, you know, the Atari video games and all that. And... You know, I'm just bored with it. Do you consider yourself to be a uh, spoiled kid? Um, not spoiled, but I've got it, you know, I could have it really pretty well off. But um, I don't choose to have it that way at all. De buitenwijken van Los Angeles, waar de voornamelijk blanke middelklaas Amerikaan woont, hebben een omvang die vele malen groter is dan Amsterdam, Rotterdam en Den Haag samen. Die verveling van de kinderen kan ik me wel voorstellen. Openbaar vervoer is er niet, de afstanden zijn veel te groot om te lopen of te fietsen. Voor elke verplaatsing heb je de auto van je ouders nodig, die je pas mag berijden als je 16 bent. Eigenlijk verlaat je het kleine gebied van je eigen wijkje zelden of nooit. Behalve om naar school te gaan of naar het winkelcentrum. They don't like to let, let the little kids, you can't even climb trees and everything. Well, when we were little, like, we did a lot more than we were supposed to, and then, like, now the, they crack down, I guess, on the other kids. Like, a lot, like, there's, like, a group, about 10 of us that just did anything we wanted. They couldn't really do anything. But now it got to the point where it's just, I mean, it's basically for adults. I mean, if, it'd be fine for an adult to live here, like, if you're over 35 and just wanted to be laid back, but... It's not a very good place for a kid to grow up because there's like nothing here to do. It's a good playground, there's no traffic. Yeah, uh, oh yeah, like there's like a few parks, but like the kids used to play like baseball and football and then they, got, they didn't like that, so they put trees in the park and stuff. It's really stupid how they're so like restrictive with it. You can take this way home. It's like, but all these places are like, look the same. It's always so quiet in here and everything now that nobody lives here. Either all my friends either moved out, moved away or something, so I'm the only one that stayed around. Mm -hmm. But I just really sleep here, basically. See, it's like, really like a ghost town. <laughs> There's nothing in here. It's like total suburbia type crowd. Now they just put a big parking lot over here. Uh, over the wall. That used to be a big field we, when we were younger. We used to go there and play too. But now it's just, you just either stay in the house or go, because it's nothing for like my friends and me to do here.
if your kid uh, would be a punk, uh, would it worry you? No, because I think the attitude's right. But I mean, by the time if I had kids, I mean, I don't know what. I mean, they'd probably be in a lot worse things than punk or something like that. Because the way the world's going now, I don't know. And punks feel this way about the world now, I guess the world's going downhill, so by the time I had kids, they'd probably be carrying guns or something. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. You think uh, uh, the world is declining? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. And uh, being a punk is uh, one sign of it? Not, be not being a sign of declining, but like... I don't know, just more like ready for it because like we're not living in a stupid fantasy of fancy cars and everything. And just like trying to pretend it's not there because it is there. We face more reality, I think, than normal people. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, the world will improve uh, <clears throat> because... It might, I don't know how, but... And because uh, you're, you're I mean, I don't more think, sense of reality than... Uh, right, I mean, I don't think it'll, like, blow up or something, but, I mean, the way it is, it's just... I mean, the way the inflation or thing, I mean, there'll either be a depression or a war or something. So this is the place uh, where you live? Yeah. <laughs> After you left uh, your parents' house? No, I've lived in about eight other places since I left my parents' house. Mm -hmm. and, and these are the people uh, with who you are living with at the moment? Yeah, these and a few other people. Mm. What's your age? 17. And I just turned 17. Yeah. And you ran away from home? Um, yeah, it was kind of a kidnapping. <laughs> um, well, I was having a lot of trouble with my grandparents. Like, hassles about school, of course. Um, drug problem. Alcohol problem. Smoking problem. The <laughs> usual. Um, so your grandparents had a, a problem? No, drug problem. I did. <laughs> um, a friend of mine, um, like wanted to take me up to L.A. and we like tried to talk to him. But uh, they didn't <coughs> seem to understand, so um, I just pretended I was going to go to a baseball game and never went back. Uh, you never got, uh, went back? Um, I don't know, I really don't care for them. I don't care for their religion. I don't care for them, period. That's about it. It's just, uh, it's just... It's, it's a waste of time, really. Uh, what's, a what's a waste of time? I, I couldn't follow. Um, uh, certain religions, school. Yeah? Grandparents. Grandparents? <laughs> uh, um, parents are gone, so I have to worry about grandparents. Yeah. Uh, you think it's stupid, all those? Um, it's not really stupid, it's just... Um, well, to put it, to put it kind of blunt, it's boring. It's not stupid, it's just boring. Mm -hmm. And what's the exciting thing uh, of... Um, trying to live on your own. You know, like um, on the streets or um, with friends. Mm -hmm. It's not exciting, but it's um, a little more challenging. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, living in a nice home, getting everything you want, <coughs> it, it tends to... Um, spoil people a lot you know if you have everything you want you grow up to be uh <laughs> rotten because if you learn um you'll have a lot better life i suppose mm -hmm. at least that's what i think so the lifestyle uh, has something to do with uh making things more difficult uh, than they right more uh, difficult than would they are. be uh, on, on our ways. Uh, can, can you follow me? It's uh, like uh, um, in horse races, uh, the, the good horses get a handicap. Uh, and uh, 
It's about the same uh, what you're doing with life. Um, yeah, kind of. Yeah? So what handicaps uh, do you give yourself? Um, I don't eat. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. Um, it's hard to find a place to stay. Yeah, you had some french fries today. <laughs> I know, I had some french fries today. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's, um, trying to find a place to stay. Trying to stay alive. How, how do you stay alive? Well, if I have to, I panhandle. Um, what? Panhandle? Panhandle. Um, well, this is a real blunt way of putting it. Um, beg for money. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't care to do it, but uh, <coughs> in dire need, I need to. Like, Set yourself up that way. When I first moved to L.A., I was just having such a blast, and, I mean, it, it was really, weird. you know, self-destructive. It was, like we say, a handicap. I mean, within three months, I'd had, you know, I broke my arm twice from fighting. <laughs> I had um, six black eyes. Um, just, like, fighting all the time. That was one of my handicaps when I first, you know, moved here because I didn't know that many people and me and Maggie were always getting in fights with people <laughs> even though she knew a lot of people but she's like... She didn't like them. <laughs> Maggie can be really, never get in fights. Maggie can be really mean. <laughs> um, but other handicaps were just like smoking a lot, not eating properly, just stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Wearing dirty clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing too bad. Not sleeping in a bed. Oh, yeah. Whoa. Um, having to wash your hair with uh, yeah. dishwashing soap. <laughs> yep. Not having toilet paper. Um, yeah. No um, toilet. Not, <laughs> not <Trusty> having pants. <laughs> <laughs> not having dishes. Like, there was a point when I only had one pair of shoes, and they had holes in them. And there were a pair of army boots that were too big for me. And I looked really funny, and people would call me olive oil because my feet were so big. <laughs> Days. I could have been gone for more. Really, I said, don't care what my line on the floor. Come on, I don't want to be. Come on, let you sleep. Well, I'll own it, baby, it's all up. I'll own it, baby, it's all up. I made lots of friends. I know I need the rest. So, sleeping don't play me, baby. Let's share it back. Come on, I don't want to be. But that's the key thing, she thinks I'm very ill He says I go crazy, I think I'm fucking fail Come on, I want to be Come on, I want to be I sit on a pedestal Waking me so new Why is that we've been poor? A day is on us, come on, yeah So strong, ready to love it. We're all on the danger zone, all on the danger zone. We're all on our telephone, I should blow with someone who I have a chance. Who has a number two? I, I mean, I would never, like, push anybody around. I always stayed off the dance floor and stuff because a couple of times I did, I got hurt really badly. And I knew it was my own fault. I couldn't be mad at any particular person. It was my own fault that it happened, you know, because people were just knocking each other around. And I started knocking back, you know, and I, it wasn't worth it to me in the end. I see, to a lot of those kids, it's still worth it to do that. It's not to me. I was bruised like badly and I didn't want to go through it. I noticed uh, quite some uh, 
let's call it self-destructional uh, uh, forces uh, with uh, punk kids. Um, yeah, I guess they are. Um, um, I've been referred to as being like a lot self-destructive and I've been put down by those same people for being self-destructive. But, um, so when I look at them and I know that I can like pinpoint it and say that's what they're doing, it's, um, it's really, it's really odd because, um, you know, they would get mad at me for like, um, mm, getting too drunk and driving too fast or something and for them uh you know they can walk into walls and you know cut up their arms and stuff and it's not the same thing you know i mean would it have been cooler had i like you know written things some of uh, which i have done also you know i don't know i guess it is it's sort of um self-destruction is kind of just a means of showing that what you if you're cutting up your body or whatever you're doing, it's sort of marking it as it's your own. It's one thing that you can call completely and totally your own. And, you know, it's like so much of people's identity is being taken away. Like a lot, even in like, even being a punk, a lot of that's the sameness. But um, you, still, you still need a personal identity. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. like where everybody's coming from is they're just seeing the same thing happening to them that's happened to their parents and mm -hmm. and the same just the same i don't know sort of wasted life you know and so they they claim something as their own and they can always their body is always their own they can always mark on that or cut on that or like push up against somebody or shave their heads or you know, color their hair, or whatever, you know, it's a mark of this is my body, you know. I know I don't want to grow up. What's there to grow up to, you know? I really don't want to end up like most of those people going to work nine to five and looking yeah. horrible all day and ugh, working in an office. Come now. That would be quite boring. Mm. Working like my dad is self-destructive. So you take drugs. Occasionally. <laughs> yeah. What kind? Um, anything I can get my little paws on. <laughs> what? Anything I can get my little paws on. Hands, like, paws. Like? Um, like? Anything from uppers to downers, speed junk, anything. Up, anything. down, sideways. <laughs> <laughs> um, I prefer down. hallucinogenics. What's that? Um, acid, mescaline. Acid. LSD. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's not as good as it used to be, but it still does the job. It makes you laugh. I like to laugh. I like to be a little kid. It's lots of fun. You like to be a little kid? Yeah. Of course. It's more fun than being grown up. Having having a serious life, it's, it's too straight. You don't have any fun. Even if I grow older, I think I'll just like... If, still act like a little kid yeah. just to have fun but you know? when you're old and you act like a little kid yeah, when i'm 80, zero, a total 80 years old i'll probably be hanging out with teenagers <laughs> i'm not gonna be no, definitely not i'm not gonna grow up to be old <laughs> but it i may look it but i won't be it <laughs> it isn't necessarily uh, boring uh, to grow up i think or do you think it is yeah it's boring yeah in certain ways. It's how my parents are, and like my mom sells Tupperware, and that's definitely. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I don't want to sell Tupperware. <laughs> and most, a lot of kids do turn out like their parents, but not the kids here. I'm turning out just not. like my parents. <laughs> Gimme, gimme this! Gimme, gimme that! Yeah, yeah! Gimme it! Now! Gimme it! Um, who, who, who of you knew uh, uh, Darby Crash? All of you, yeah? What uh, kind of... Uh, guy was he? I looked up to him. I thought he was a genius. I thought he was real smart. Every, everything he said to me I thought was 
pretty intelligent, except sometimes when he was all wasted. He was just utter <laughs> bullshit. But I, I thought he was a pretty smart guy, and I thought he just, like, let his <clears throat> life go to waste just by killing himself. Just kind of selfish in a way. Yeah. But Very selfish. He was, yeah. There's no idols, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. in punk rock, you know, and there's no... In the L.A. scene, there's been a lot of talented musicians, but... Darby was someone who people looked up to and who start he started <coughs> trends and he was he was real people really looked up to him in the fact that he was so talented in the music he did and um it is it is a shame you know because he was really cool he was a little bit too much into drugs but then mm -hmm. everybody is you know he's just like one of a kind person someone you'll right. never meet again not no one there's no one that could be like him at all you know i don't i don't think he let people get too close to him though because yeah, he, he i think he knew he that he wanted to kill himself i'm i don't know but i don't think he let people get too close to him he didn't want Maybe. people like him too much yeah. or they yeah. get too attached yeah. because he knew what he was going to do supposedly yeah. darby and i were like um, we were really close friends, and um, we were really, really close. Darby, the best way to put it is that Darby protected me more than, more than anybody else ever has in my life, and more than he ever did for anybody. It, for um, most of the time, it was like girls always protecting him. Oh, no, Darby, you can't have that knife. Oh, no, Darby, you can't do this. Oh, no, Darby, you should never own a motorcycle. Oh, no, Darby, you're going to come with me right now, you know? And I never did that. I was more like, um, he didn't tell me what to do because he felt I was really intelligent. He just... Um, he just sort of made sure nothing happened to me. He, uh, you know, one time we were walking into the Starwood and this girl said something and it was like so like, I don't, I don't pay any attention to what people say anymore. And he, he was like a few steps behind me and uh, he, um, I got up to the door and I said, where the hell, you know, he comes running up and he goes, where were you? And he goes, I go, well, what do you mean, where was I? He goes, I just hit this girl for you. And I go, what'd you do that for? And he goes, well, she said something about you. And I said, well, what did she say? And he goes, I don't know. I just, she just said something, so I went back and hit her. I went, God, would you just, that's a little embarrassing, you know, don't do that. But he was really good to me. It was after, like, after the germs played the last time. I mean, all the people that I've gone out with and hung around with and everything, what happened was, um... I was in the dressing room. First, they weren't going to let me in. And I said, what are you going to do, leave me standing out here alone? I really am with Darby. And I went in, and I was sitting in the back of the room, and he just, like, opened the door really fast. And in front of all these people, he goes, Casey, where's Casey? Where is she right now? And I said, I said right here. And he, like, threw his arms around me and kissed me. And he said, don't worry, I've got drugs. And here's the money. Go, you know, divide it. And he trusted me that way, you know. He, um, he like, really believed in me. And, um... It was something, we had the same kind of mood swings. We would, like, if we were drinking, we'd forget the same things, and we'd remember the same things, and it was really a joke, you know? It was a joke at the time, the fact that we, you know, both went up and down at the same time. But what, um, but that was also what was to hurt us. And um, we'd been, like, kidding around about it. You know, we always did about, you know, how we would kill ourselves and, you know, stuff like that. And then the time came and, um, and, and we did it and he died. Um, there are a lot more details, you know, he died, but I didn't. I mean, I did technically die for about three minutes. I think uh, two and a half, three minutes. I read the police report and, um, for me, it was really hard because, see, a lot of people said the general feeling was that Darby didn't mean for me to die. And um, he didn't mean for me to die and that he did it on purpose and stuff like that, which is untrue. Um, he did mean for me to die because I was dead for a few minutes. We'd worked out already that the drugs moved slower through my veins because we'd done drugs and we'd known what was going on. And I don't understand uh, why why you both did decide to, to die? We talked about suicide before, um, and we talked about committing suicide together before, but not in a serious way. But a lot of stuff you say isn't exactly always in like a heavy, serious, you know, in bed kind of conversation. Some of it's just a 
conversation and we just we both just looked at each other and the night was just like so it was just such a bad night and we just and once we left we said we told people we're going we're gonna go kill ourselves you know that's it we said it like nobody believed us you know but once that had been done we were just like you know going and what and we got started and we were doing it and people really have doubts about the fact of whether you know we really thought we were going to die people will swear to me that darby doesn't think he was going to die and i know for a fact that he wanted to die you know he wrote he wrote a suicide note thinking he was going to die. He knew how much drugs he was doing, and he did think he was going to die. And he did also think that I was going to die. I had to realize, like, I woke up in the arms of a of a dead man. A lot of people like have this thing about how he laid himself out like a cross, which he didn't. His arms were around me, you know, and it's like, it's a very frightening feeling if that's the way you wake up. And that's the one person who's like, you know, loves you. You know, it's like very, it was very, very hard for me. And um, it's, I'm still getting over it. The hardest thing is not having the support of your friends, I guess. I have to pull myself together. Not anybody else can. And and somebody, you know, they ask me all the time about wanting to die. And I can honestly say there is not a moment that I'm awake, and there's not a moment that I uh, know when I'm going on that I that I don't wish that I had died that that night, you know. But um, but since I didn't, I'm not going to sit alone in my room and cry about it. Waiting for me.
recently Friends have been departing permanently I plan to stick around, you see I'm a life lover, that's me Yes, recently Friends have been departing permanently I plan to stick around, you see I'm a life lover, that's me Now all my parts work, my eyes and my nose, my hands and my fingers and my arms and my toes, and it makes me love life. Oh yes it does, I'm not gonna go away, I'm here to stay, cause recently, friends have been disappearing mysteriously, but not me, I plan to stick around, you see, I'm a life lover, that's me, oh yeah. Now it hasn't always been easy Sometimes I get real depressed too But I decided to stay here And if I can do it Even you can do it too Cause recently Friends have been departing permanently I plan to stick around, you see I'm a life lover, that's me uh -huh. I'm a life Lover, that's me. Oh, yeah, Frank's alive. Lover, that's me. Stick around.